So one of the uh, interesting things that happened during COVID uh, is was to watch how school districts responded. And the Orange School District said to the students that uh, you couldn't, your grade could not be diminished, but you could always improve. And so students had a, a, a choice to make. You could be happy with what you've got, or you could dig in and move forward. But one way or the other, you weren't going to do anything worse than you had. So there was a sense of freedom, a sense of, I'm not going to, you know, fail that test. It's not going to drag me down or, or those kind of, it was a safety net for them. It didn't protect them from the pandemic, didn't keep them from getting sick, but it wasn't going to make life any worse for them as far as their grades were concerned. We live in a world that isn't uh, going to make following Jesus easy. In fact, uh, it'll probably make it harder. However, you can have confidence because of your salvation. And that's what this letter wants to focus on. You can be confident that because of your salvation, there's nothing in this world that they can do to you that will impact your salvation or your relationship with Jesus. That's what we're going to dig into today. So we've been studying the gospel of Mark, right? Uh, we've been studying the gospel of Mark. Uh, but Mark was not the author of the gospel. He was only the scribe. Who was he writing on behalf of? Peter. Uh, Peter was the one who was was writing, and, and uh, Peter off, authored two other books or letters, uh, but they also were not written by Mark they were, or, or Peter. They were authored by him. Uh, first and second Peter were authored or written by a guy named Silvanus or Silvus, depending on your translation. He probably used scribes because, remember, he was a uh, common uneducated fisherman. So he didn't know the uh, language of the world, the, the Greek. He may have known some things. Of course, the, the language was all over the place and stuff like that. But he may not have been fluent enough to be able to communicate in letters to people enough that people from other cultures could read them and understand them and stuff like that. So uh, since we finished listening to Peter's account of the life of Jesus, I wanted to continue that a little bit and stay within Peter's mind, stay within Peter's thinking and see what else he had to come and contribute to this conversation because Peter sticks around. It's, it doesn't end with the resurrection. Peter's life continues on to that. This letter is written about 64 AD, about 30 years after the crucifixion resurrection of Jesus. Peter is no longer the hipster Jesus that you see on the Chosen series. He's now closer to Grandpa Jesus, may have been Grandpa Jesus, uh, but closer to that age. We're no longer in Jerusalem or Galilee, but they are now in other countries outside of the land. And uh, they're not prim dealing primarily with the Jewish people anymore. He was given a, a Hebrew name, Simeon or Simon. Paul calls him by his Aramaic name, which is uh, Cephas or Kepha. And uh, that's used, uh, sometimes he'll use Simon Kepha or Simon Peter. Um, but Peter itself comes from the Greek word Petros, which has been Latinized to what we call him today, Peter. And that's actually the name that's used most often in the New Testament, which is really interesting if you think about it. So I want you to remember Peter, uh, by the way, in Mark's account, we last saw him scared and hiding, denying Jesus three times. Uh, Peter, Mark, Peter in his gospel uh, doesn't even include the restoration that John does later. So we don't see him restored. It may have been because the end of that gospel has actually uh, been lost and, and not there. Um, we're not sure. But we do know that uh, we don't get that in, in his own version of the gospel. The other gospels tell us that he was restored, of course, uh, by the resurrected Jesus. But then his story continues in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, we see him begin to actually step up and lead, not just like bull in a china shop, but actually he facilitates the restoration of Judas had left his seat empty at the table. And so he facilitates the rest, or, you know, someone else uh, taking that seat. In Acts chapter 2, he becomes the first preacher, uh, preacher at the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 4, he appears before the court of the Sanhedrin. In Acts chapter 5, he becomes the judge over some people that are actually stealing from the church. Acts chapter 9, he's leading and establishing congregations all over the area that we would now call Israel. Acts chapter 10, he has this vision about Gentiles that actually changes forever the relationship between Judaism and the Gentiles together. Uh, partially due to persecution and partially due to the growth of this thing called the way of Jesus around the world, 
uh, he goes off. He no longer stays in Jerusalem. He begins moving. He goes up into Antioch. He's up in there. And then he moves into the region that we're going to talk about today, that these letters were written to into the area of Turkey. Uh, and so he's traveling like them. He's talking with them. He probably lived in Corinth for some time. And then he actually ends up living uh, by tradition in the city of Rome, the capital city, where he becomes the lead shepherd among the different synagogues and churches that are there in the city until his death by uh, crucifixion as an old man, as you see him there, he does live to be an, an old man in, in the 60s, upside down, uh, under the persecution of Emperor Nero, uh, outside the Circus Maximus, which is uh, just on the edges of what we would now call uh, the Vatican. It was called Vatican Hill. That's why it's called the Vatican. It's on a hill. And the circus was there. And the games were there. And people were persecuted. Christians were persecuted and killed there. And then there was a graveyard just outside there. And he was buried by tradition in that graveyard, which is where now um, that St. Peter's Basilica is has been built. And that's where that is. Does that all make sense? Yeah. So all of a sudden you got this really like this scared hiding guy that's out becomes a really a world changer. He's out changing yeah. and you know doing his putting his life at stake. As we read, I, I want to continue the themes that we um, were studying this last couple of weeks, this last couple of months. And in terms of the Passover lamb, and we did the Seder and the language of the Passover lamb that was included in Mark, but also that uh, some of the language that we left off on, especially on Resurrection Sunday, talking about the fig tree, and the fig tree representing humanity and, and humans and trees and some of that language that's there. So we're going to see that as well. So open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 25. Father, be honored in our conversation today. Um, Spirit, now's your time to start digging into our lives. Use your words and uh, be honored in Jesus' name. Amen. So Peter, and uh, in this, uh, it uses his, um, his nickname, Peter, an apostle of Jesus the Messiah, to those who are elect, um, we could say chosen, depends on anybody, elect or chosen, any other words that are used there in your Bibles? These are important words. That's why I'm highlighting them. It's intentional words that are there, or exiles, strangers, exiles. Um, these are code words because these are words that he's trying to, he's using these words intentionally to get our minds to go back and say, oh, I see what you're talking about. And so when he uses the word elect, he's talking about Abraham, who was chosen, or the people of the nation of Israel, who was chosen. Uh, he was also sent into exile. He was told to leave Ur and to go. And then the uh, nation of Israel was sent into exile into Egypt. So those are code words to send back. And you're supposed to see God calling out a people uh, for a purpose. He says, uh, the elect, those who are of the dispersion, this dispersion also is a code words some of your language your bible versions will say strangers pilgrims aliens sojourners one version is actually called scattered refugees i think that's my favorite one uh, that's in there we're scattered refugees um and and it's first of all talking about the people of israel that they they considered themselves scattered among the nations of the earth everywhere you go there was jewish people present there were synagogues present um, but it also, and, and he's writing mainly, this book is written mainly to a Jewish audience who has decided to follow Jesus. And which makes sense because Galatians tells us that Peter was called to be the apostle to the circumcised, yeah. right? So this is this is who he's writing to. So it says, to the diaspora in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. I got a map here just so you get that. We're talking about northern Turkey. Um, you'll notice that these are not cities. These are regions. And so he's writing. This letter was not meant to be sent to Paul wrote to the Ephesians or he wrote to the Corinthians or the Thessalonians. Right. He wrote to a city in a place. Peter is writing. This is why we call it a circular letter or a pastoral letter. He's writing letters to this whole region of churches that he's been involved with, um, that there are people there that he's writing to. And so that's there. Um, he's writing them to remind them that despite the circumstances, and this is going to come out in the letter as as we grow, uh, as we go, and specifically the persecution, that despite the persecution, they are still those things that we talked about. They are still chosen, and they are still exiles. And verse two continues, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, 
in the sanctification of the spirit for the obedience to Jesus and for sprinkling of his blood. Ding, 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 ding. Alarms should go off. You just saw the Trinity there. First of all, it says the father, right? The father chose them. Uh, the Holy Spirit then lives in them, sanctifies them, makes them holy. And the son to whom we are obedient because of your sacri his sacrifice for us. So they have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all within one verse. You don't get that a lot, but it is there. So you need to, that's, people say there's no such thing as Trinity in scripture, just to highlight that. So he says it's for obedience. Those three things, the choosing of the, the, choosing of the Father, the sanctific sanctification of the Holy Spirit, and the blood of Jesus all work together uh, to make us obedient. If you're obedient, what does that make you? disciples right that's the code word if you're obedient as someone who's obedient to the teachings of jesus that's what we would call a disciple so the choosing of the father the sanctifying work of the holy spirit uh with mixed with the blood of jesus lead to should lead to obedience that's what he's going to tell us here so may grace and peace be multiplied to you blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ you should hear and jewish person would hear this is what we said at the Seder, right? This is what every Jewish uh, person begins their day with. Blessed be the God and Father. And then uh, it changes a little bit, but that's the beginning of it. So he's writing to a Jewish audience and he's speaking to them in a language that they're familiar with. He's beginning this next couple of verses is all part of a blessing. According to his great mercy, he has caused us, God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through whom the resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah from the dead. Your salvation is not in a tomb. It's not in an empty tomb. It is not even in a man who died, but it is in the resurrected yes, Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. He has called us to a living hope and to an inheritance. Listen to these words. These are big words. Imperishable. That's a big word. If you have a tree in your garden that's imperishable, that's a pretty amazing tree because every tree in my garden is perishable, right? Undefiled. That's a big word too. Unfading. There was not a fabric in the ancient world that didn't fade at some level. No matter how expensive it was, it, it faded. Unfading. And it's kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for the salvation ready to be revealed in that last time. Where is your inheritance in your salvation? In Jesus. It's in Jesus. Who is where? In heaven. According to this verse, it's in heaven. So it doesn't matter how big or powerful the Roman emperor is. It doesn't matter even how big and powerful the sword is that comes against you because your salvation isn't here on earth. It's in heaven. And it's guarded and secure, he says. This will be the key as we're moving forward because he's laying a foundation because this is what's going to give you confidence and courage that your grades aren't going to be changed just because you got COVID. All right, all right. It's a in this, verse six, in this you rejoice. This is enough. This, the fact that your salvation is untouchable by anything on earth is what should be the foundation of your joy and hope. This should give you, no matter what they do for you, you can smile and laugh at them in the face and say, guess what? There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do, regardless of your circumstances, your bank account, your health insurance, your health at all, no matter what's going on with you, how bad your neighbors are, how bad your boss is, no matter what it is that's there, ultimately your salvation is secure. It's taken care of. It's in Jesus. Though now for a little while, it is, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Life gets real, right? Because there are bosses from hell. There are health issues that are out of our control. Yeah. There are uh, kids that do things in your life that just drive you crazy. There are all of those things are there. Life gets real, yeah. but so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Lots of pre people praise Jesus on Sunday, but then Monday hits and they got to deal with that boss or life hits and their, their insurance gets out of control or their health gets out of control or whatever it is. They start shaking their fist in heaven and say, how could you do this to me? Right. Mm -hmm. Monday is where the test your faith is, not Sunday morning. 
The Amen. fact that you're sitting here isn't the test of faith. The fact is, what's going to happen on Monday morning when you get smashed right in the face with whatever the world wants to throw your way? Verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. Do you? Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's where the rubber hits the road. That's yeah. where it comes from. Obtaining the outcome of the faith, the salvation of your souls. The joy that you have is a sign of your salvation. Verse 10. Concerning this salvation. Now, again, this is the topic that Peter wants to, because people are wondering, like, you know, if, you know, what's going to, all this stuff is going on around us. We're being persecuted. We're being chased. We're being, you know, what does that mean for our salvation? And I'm going to skip over a couple of verses because he fills in a lot. Of, there's a lot of extra words here. So I diagram verses when I'm doing my study and diagramming helps me to break out the fluff from the main point. Mm. And the main point is concerning our salvations, the, our salvation, the prophets, prophets searched and inquired carefully. So the prophets and all that out there, historically, the prophets were out there looking for what does this salvation mean? What is it doing? Verse 12, it says it was revealed to him, to them that they were serving not themselves, but you and the things that have now been announced. They didn't understand it completely, but now it has been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things in which angels long to look. Uh, the prophets thought it was a pretty amazing thing as they, they look forward, because it was, how is this going to happen? The angels who saw the hand at work, they're in the kitchen with God as all this is coming together, all the ingredients are coming together. They're watching and saying, wow, as this is all going together. Verse 13 says, therefore, whenever there's a therefore, you look what was before, right? So since your salvation is guarded in heaven, since it was prophesied from ages to the ages past, since it is so marvelous that the angels are amazed at what's going on, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Does your verse say anything else? What, what does your verse say there? What are the words? Gird up your loins. This is one of those passages where we have uh, sanitized the Jewishness or the ancient world out of it because the verse does say, gird up your loins, which it means prepared your mind. Yeah. But really, what he's trying to do is we're talking in the context of the Exodus. And what happened in the Exodus? They said, on that night, I'm going to have a lamb, prepare the lamb, put the paint, uh, put the blood on the doors and gird up your loins and get ready to go. And so what he's doing here is saying, based on the fact that all of this stuff is taken care of, the blood has already been shed in the lamb. Get your mind ready because now the race is about to happen. Come on, come on. Now it's about to get difficult. Now the, the Pharaoh's army is about to come after you in the midst of this. So there's a several others that use uh, the gird up your loins of your mind uh, language, but it loses it when we sanitize some of the Jewishness out of the scripture. It means the same uh, thing, but you lose its cultural context, which I think the cultural context helps us to understand the mindset that Peter was in when he's writing this gospel. Therefore, do whatever it takes to get your mind focused on your salvation as things are about to get hot and heavy. Being sober-minded this also has has language i think that in it that means sober minded to us gives us the mind of someone that's drunk or whatever it's really not that meaning the 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 meaning here is be calm be patient be controlled don't freak out all right gird up your mind things are about to get tough don't freak out iran is going to send 300 missiles to israel don't freak out mm. Gird up your mind, recognize your salvation is in heaven. And no matter what happens in this world, there's nothing Iran can do to touch your salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It may get rough, but gird up your mind, be sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. The totality of our salvation is not here. We have a now and not yet. We get a little bit now. We get the Holy Spirit now. We get the hope now. We get the joy now. But the fullness of our salvation comes when Jesus returns and we get to go to heaven and there's no more tears. There's no more suffering. That's the not yet. That's that's what's going out. But we have to wait for that part of it. Verse 14 says, as obedient children, again, obedient is a code word for 
disciples. So as obedient children, what does obedience look like? Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So before they came to Jesus, they were legalistic, religious fanatics. That's, remember, because he's talking to a largely Jewish audience. But as he who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your contact, conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. That's what God said to them during the Exodus. Be a holy people for I am holy. I'm going to now be living in your midst in a tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm going to live in your midst, you need to be a holy, holy people. Amen. Amen. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to the, each one's deeds. This is where you can look at what the school said when they called and they said, well, your grades are frozen. You can't do any worse. So you could just disappear and just not do any homework at all. Or you can get involved. Jesus says that our sins are forgiven. So we can rest on our laurels and figure whatever we do. Paul deals with this in, in the book of Romans, by the way. So I'm not going to go into that. It's a whole different book on it. Since we're forgiven, then it doesn't matter what I do. That I can, you know, what doesn't matter the kind of life that I live. And James chapter 2 verse 17 says, faith without action is dead. And so our faith needs to... If it's real faith, it will produce fruit in our lives consistent with the faith that we have. Our lives will change. Yes. Amen. If someone says they're following Jesus, their life will change. Amen. Right? Amen. So he continues to say, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. There's that code word again. Knowing that you were ransomed. There's another one because remember that's what the Passover lamb. It was a ransom for our souls. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. Those feudal ways were the religious uh, legalism that they were caught up in. And so he continues to point out throughout this passage. He's going to point us back to that Passover lamb. We just did the Seder. So you should, this should all be right and fresh on your mind. And the ransom by the blood of the lamb. He says you were ransomed. Not with the perishable things as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, like that of the lamb without blemish or spot. Remember the Passover lamb had to be without blemish or spot. John called Jesus the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right? Verse 20, he who has foreknown before the, who was foreknown before the foundation of the world. John also said in the beginning was the word and the word was uh, God and the word was with God. From the foundation, he reiterate, uh, Peter reiterates that here. He was foreknown before the foundations of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. This is the foundation of our faith. This is, this is, this is where we begin. If you don't have that cleared up, and that's the first question we all ought to ask ourselves, do you have? A relationship with Jesus has your have your sins been washed away by the blood of the Lamb because that's where we begin. That becomes the foundation of everything else he's going to say in this book. So, and then I want to point us back to our Easter Sunday conversation about humans being trees and trees have fruit, trees bear fruit. The fig tree that uh, uh, Jesus condemned, remember that whole conversation? If that is your root, if the foundation in Jesus and his death and resurrection on your behalf, his blood has washed your sins away. If that is the root of your faith, then what is the fruit in your life? Verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, this is what you should do. This should be the fruit. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, remember that tree, but of the of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and it, it, all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower fails, but the word of God remains forever. And this word is good news that was preached to you. The fruit of your salvation and walking in obedience with Jesus to the teachings of Jesus should be, according to him, our love for one another. Chapter 2 says, so, which is the same as saying, therefore, so therefore, we what was before, as we love each other, put away all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that it may grow, 
grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And as you come to him, a living stone. Who is the author of this book? Peter. Peter, which means? Rock. Rock, right? It means stone. And he says, uh, it, the stone says, the stone is telling us, writing us a letter saying, Jesus is the living stone. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, like we are, we are also rejected, like Jesus was also rejected, okay. but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Jesus was chosen and precious. Guess what he said? You are chosen and precious. You okay. yourselves like living stones. Peter is the stone. Jesus is the living stone. And now he says we are all living stones. They're not dead stones. While they're living, uh, while they're still alive, God has a purpose for them. You are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Again, he's using that Exodus imagery that they are built in the tabernacle, which eventually became the temple, Exodus chapter 19. He's preparing them, uh, comparing them to the temple and to the priesthood giving them their exile purpose because they're feeling that they're feeling what that we're wandering in the desert lord we're going around in circles for 40 years here we're feeling the persecution of all these nations coming against us that's the exile that he's comparing them to and as they come back as they they feel that he wants them to notice that in the same way that god had a purpose for their exile he has a purpose for your exile mm -hmm. as it feels like you're on the edge you're at the edge of of everything to become that he wants us to become in the midst of our, uh, that's all to train us to become a spiritual house, a holy priesthood for the purpose of, and he says here, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I'm laying a, in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in, in him will not be put to shame. In your wandering, in your wildering, in your wonder, Lord, where are you in the midst of this? You will not be put to shame. He will not allow that to happen. Your struggle is not in vain. Verse seven, so honor, so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and now a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word and they were destined to do so. Remember his early choice of words, chosen and elect, he continues to use those words to describe us. Verse nine, but you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. These are all words from Exodus 19, by the way, when he's talking about the people as he's calling them out, he's saying the purpose of the exile was to make them into a nation that would shine before the world and show them that Yahweh is the only God that can do anything, can make anything out of your lives. That was their purpose. And now he's saying, you have the same thing and you are now in your own exile. You are wandering, you are strangers, you are aliens, you are foreigners wandering in the land and it feels like you're lost, but God is using this to make you a chosen and holy nation if we would just do what he is now asking of us. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into that marvelous light. So there's that choice, right? Monday morning, you get slammed by the world. You shake your fist or you proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. That's the choice that we have. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So now what? This is the therefore. Since your salvation is guarded in heaven, it was prophesied from the ages past. And it's so marvelous that the angels wonder that God would do that for his people because they can't be saved. Angels can't be saved. That's a whole different story. So we are all strangers. We are all aliens. We're all pilgrims. We are all living in exile as refugees. I think that's, the, again, the best one that's in there. We don't quite fit in the culture. We're wandering around lost. You know, we don't have a place. If you are too comfortable, maybe that's the problem. The choosing of the Father, the sanctifying of the work of the Holy Spirit mixed with the blood of Jesus leads us to, or should lead us to, obedience. Our faith should change us. And that's the question. What is changing in you today? What needs to change in you today? Based on what the Holy Spirit, same Holy Spirit is there. What does the Holy Spirit want to change in your life, your thoughts, 
your actions, your attitudes. So let us keep focused on Jesus. Don't freak out because the world is out of control, but focus on Jesus living in obedience. And so as we come for the Lord's table today to be reminded again, again of the cost the death and resurrection, the blood of Jesus shed on our behalf. Because of that, we have access. We have the now and we have the not yet. It's coming in the future. And in the meantime, we come and we state, and as we're being hit in the face by whatever it is the world wants to throw on our face, I come because I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that I am part of his body, that he still has me as a living stone. He still has me here because he wants me to be a part of his temple he wants me to accomplish something for his purposes i still have a mission and so i'm standing here in faith no matter how how hard the headwinds are blowing in my face i stand in faith oh, okay thank you jesus that you made it possible for us to be a royal priesthood a holy nation set aside that you would call us for your purposes as we come forward to remember your death for us anchor in our hearts again the hope of the salvation that is not yet and yet at the same time we ask that your your spirit would give us the courage to live within the salvation that we have now change us holy spirit in jesus name Amen.